Would you turn, Dylan, to Romans 6 and verse 6? It's page 981. Romans 6 and verse 6. It was really the truth in this verse that the Holy Spirit used to transform my life after I'd been a Christian for 12 or 13 years. Romans 6 and verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And for years I understood it intellectually, but it wasn't real inside at all. Have you uh, received a newspaper from your hometown uh, ever? I, I got one from Belfast, Northern Ireland, just this last week. And it really looks terribly provincial, doesn't it, when you read back, you know, find out what they're arguing about. And yet... My newspaper was filled, as you can guess, with the shooting and the bombing. Uh, oh, there were several instances. Last month, the terrorists set uh, a building on fire, and one fireman called Morrison, I think was his name, uh, was trying to put it out to prevent it spreading to other houses. And he was shot in the back by other terrorists as he was trying to put the fire out. Uh, in another situation, a, a policeman called Douglas went out into the middle of the road uh, to try to lift a lady who had been hurt in a car accident and take her over to the ambulance. And a terrorist shot him in the back four times you know, as he was lifting her off the side of the pavement. And it's that kind of incident that makes you realize, you know, man's inhumanity to man is almost beyond description. And uh, you read of, was it Kessler or Kessler? You remember the, the prisoner of war? Uh, and the tortures he went through? And the wire and the rope tortures? And you remember the, the communist jailers beat him for three days solid? And he had that broken leg, you remember, that was gangrene was setting in and that kind of thing. And it seems just unbelievable, doesn't it? I think it's that kind of inhumanity of man to man that is making a lot of even humanist intellectuals begin to suspect that the power of evil in the world is really a hideous personal being of some kind. They were all very skeptical of that whole idea for a long time. But it seems it's the only way now to explain what seems to be intense hatred. Or you look at the whole Watergate affair and you see the deviousness of it. Who's, who, whoever you're supporting, I mean the thing is full of lies and back rooms, subterfuge of all kinds. And you begin to feel that there's such lying and such deceit in our world that there just has to be a supernatural being of some kind that is bringing it all about. It just seems, brothers and sisters, that we men and women could not hate each other so much that we do these things to each other on our own. You know. It's just hard to know what to make of it. And the, wherever you look at seems that as evil works itself out more and more in our world, there seems, we seem to realize repeatedly that it's not just an absence of, e of good in our world, but it's a real positive presence of evil. I'm sure you've felt the same thing. When you, you've seen things, you've seen like, things like the absolute foolishness and hideousness of a thing like deep throat, getting even as far as it has, in our world. You begin to realize some of the hideous things that go on in the world of the mafia seem to be going on even in our own society. You begin to look at a case like that Manson case, you remember, where that ritual murder takes place and you think that kind of thing couldn't happen in a civilized country. 
It seems, doesn't it, that evil is a positive power. It seems it's not just the absence of good or, or neighborliness. It seems that there's a positive supernatural being of some kind that infuses into us intense, overwhelming hatred for each other. Because certainly, even in your heart and mine, even when we're at our worst, it's hard to work up that kind of hatred, isn't it? And it really does seem, doesn't it, that independence of God or sin is an actual power in our world. Yes, it is. It's hard, really, to know how it started at all, isn't it? I mean, the world was obviously good at the beginning. It was obviously planned in such a way that it would develop beautifully. Uh, you remember how God arranged it, if you <laughs> like to look at it, Genesis 1 and 28. I know we've looked at the verse before, but I think it's good to look back to how things were. They seem to have got into such a mess today. Uh, Genesis 1.28 and uh, God blessed them and God said to them and that was the, the human beings uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and obviously at the beginning, it was really good. I mean, we all knew what we were here for. Okay, we were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And God presumably directed us as to what we should do. And he gave us tasks and responsibilities. And therefore we had a sense that uh, we were accepted by him. We had a feeling of approval when we did these things. We had a feeling that the great significant other behind the universe recognized us and knew us. And we felt that sense of approval and we knew what we were here for and we knew what we had to do. And uh, you remember God arranged in Genesis 1.29 uh, all provisions for us and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And obviously, God provided for us. Uh, we had food and shelter and clothing as we needed it. And uh, at the beginning, it was his plan that we would just rest in him, do what he had given us to do, and he would provide the necessary shelter and food and clothing for us. And we wouldn't have to scavenge for it, and we wouldn't have to hoard it when we got it. And so it was really a restful situation. God gave us tasks to do, and he provided for our needs. And then you remember in, in Genesis 2 and 29, he went really even further. Genesis 2 and 9, I'm sorry. And Genesis 2 and 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And so that we wouldn't have to try to produce emotional or spiritual thrills Artificially, God provided his own life, the life of his own spirit in us, so that we really could have satisfaction deep down spiritually, you know, and deep down satisfaction emotionally. God gave us the life of that Holy Spirit to give us a sense of enjoyment and happiness and joy and peace. And really, the whole thing was beautifully arranged. And you remember that an alien power of some kind, a supernatural power of some kind, suggested a whole new set of motives and desires that we should live by. And that's really where the thing went wrong. And this power suggested to us, why be ruled by God? Why accept the tasks he gives you? Why don't you command instead of rule? Why spend your life obeying God? Why not spend your life making other people obey you? Why spend your life doing what your Creator wants you to do? Why not spend your life making other people do what you want them to do? Why spend your life looking for God's recognition and approval? Why not make other people approve of you by forcing them to do what you want them to do? And you know that gradually we began to work on that principle. We began to work on the principle that it was our right to rule over other people. And that we ought to gain our approval from them by forcing them to obey us. And so the desire for power 
began to become almost a personal presence of evil in our world. And this supernatural being suggested to us, now listen, why depend on God for your food and your shelter and your clothing? Why wait for him to tell you what you need? Why not get what you need and what you want whenever you want it? Why not get the food and the clothing and the shelter that you want? And take all of it that you need, whatever that means to anyone else. And so you know that the whole urge for profit, for getting things, getting what we wanted because we no longer could trust God for it, began to take over many of our lives. And we began to live in order to get. And that spiritual power suggested to us, listen, why depend on God for your joy and peace? Why not be successful in this world? Get success for yourself and force other people to give you enjoyment and pleasure when you want it. It doesn't matter whose life you spoil, why not get enjoyment and satisfaction for yourself? And so, really, we went on that tremendous kick that we have, you know, just to enjoy ourselves, whatever the cost. And really, brothers and sisters, those motives and desires of profit, power, and success have become the ruling passion of our world. They really have, and you know it. And that's what has turned the place into a hell instead of the heaven that it was planned to be. And so you know yourselves that most of us live for profit, power, success. And we'll kill, and we'll shoot, and we'll bomb in order to get profit. You see it. We look at the international affair, you know, and we, we tear old Nixon apart, and we tear anybody else apart. But brothers and sisters, what the politicians do is an expression of what the nation is. And you know in your own heart that often we will do anything for profit. We'll do anything to get what we want. And we'll lie and we'll deceive for power. We'll manipulate other people to get a sense of controlling a situation. You know how often you've lied over an assignment because you want to be able to manipulate that situation as you want. You want to be able to miss the assignment and yet manipulate the situation so that you don't suffer for it. And we tend to see that in international affairs, but we're so slow to see it in our own lives. And it's the same for success. You know how many of us will scramble over the top of the heap any way we can to get success, to get success in our wives' eyes, to get success in our children's eyes, our friends' eyes, our peers' eyes. Now, brothers and sisters, it's that power that governs so much of the world that the Bible calls sin. It's that desire to live as if there's no God. And once you decide to live as if there's no God, you have to make some provision, you see, for your own needs, for your own physical needs, for your own emotional needs, for the needs of your own mind. And those were all provided for by God's plan. But once you live as if there's no God, those needs begin to dominate your life. And that becomes a driving personal power of evil inside you. And that really is how it all came about. We really took good needs that God had, needs of hunger and needs of propagating the race, and we perverted them into gluttony and into lust. And we took a real need to obey God and we turned it into a need to command other people. And we took a real need of having God approve of us and we substituted the need for having everybody else to approve of us. And so many of us are governed by that. That's what that verse means, you see, in Romans 6 and verse 6. It's at the end of the verse and it talks, you remember, about being enslaved to sin. Yeah. Romans 6 and verse 6, at the very end of the verse, we, that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And many of us find ourselves just totally enslaved to those desires. And you know it. There are times when you really want to love other people, but all that old desire for profit gets hold of you, and you just want your way, whatever it costs them. There are times when we really want to be willing to do without enjoyment and to receive the enjoyment that God gives us. But that old desire inside us says, no, we want enjoyment. And so that power of sin, of wanting to live without God, 
enslaves many of us so that we're not free people at all. And you realize it. You realize it every time you lose your temper. You realize it every time you're angry. Every time you're impatient. Every time lust gets the upper hand of you. You're, you realize, I'm not a free man, a free woman. I talk a lot about free will, but I'm not free. I'm enslaved to this power inside me. Now, it is interesting, isn't it, to see that that power often uses the body to express itself, when you think of it. It seems that in order to get satisfaction for these things, we've often ended up with our bodies. We weren't getting the thing from God through our spirits, and so many of us ended up trying to get them through our bodies. For instance, the exhilaration. The exhilaration and the sense of elation that the Holy Spirit gives. You know that most of us have tried to produce that by working the system backwards through drugs. You try to pump certain chemicals into your body to give you a kind of emotional lift that will produce the elation and exhilaration that should actually come from God's Spirit. It's interesting how we've gone to our bodies to find that. Or alcohol, you know, we've done the same with that. Uh, really, we're meant to live in complete peace without a worry in the world, trusting the Father for every day's need. But we find ourselves bound by worry. And so we take the old alcohol to try to fly high and clear off it for a little. And it's interesting how we use our bodies to try to bring the substitutes for what we can get from God only. The body becomes almost a way of expressing this attitude of sin or independence of God. It's the same, you remember, when you think of the food and clothing and shelter business. Isn't it true that rich and poor alike in our world seem utterly preoccupied with getting what the cavemen were preoccupied with getting? Just something to cover their bodies, something to cover themselves from the rain, a shelter of some kind, and food to fill them and enable them to work the next day. It is strange, isn't it, that even here, you know, in our highly prosperous society, that most of us are still preoccupied with food, clothing, shelter. Food, clothing, shelter. Doesn't matter if you're Paul Getty, you know. Doesn't matter if you're a Nasset. Doesn't matter if you're the poorest person in the theater here. We all seem to be preoccupied with those bodily needs that we have. It's interesting that the body begins to be the method we have of expressing this independence of God to the world and of kind of fulfilling the needs. You think of it even as far as ruling other people. I know we stopped clubbing our wives, most of us, but, but it, we haven't stopped our B-52s, you know. It's strange that in international affairs, and certainly in some other subtle situations, the body is still the method, the might is still the right. We still use our bodies to make other people do what we want them to do, in all kinds of subtle ways. Now, do you see... That's why God called the body the body of sin. Because it is the instrument by which we express our independence of God. And so often it has become our method of being independent of God and of getting what we need without God's help. And that's why that phrase appears, you see, in Romans 6 and verse 6 there, if you like to look at it, in the middle of the verse, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed. Now really, the Greek is the body of sin. And it doesn't mean that the body is sinful, you see? It doesn't mean that your body is evil. And uh, the Manichaeans, you remember, and other heretics went away out in that direction. They said the body is evil. It isn't. God is not teaching that the body is evil. He's teaching that it has often become a body of sin. It has often been the instrument by which we express our independence of God. And so, for instance, we've only to look at a person coming through withdrawal from drugs to see that the body has got used to doing something in a way that is independent of God. And so it almost has to have the whole process reversed. So it has, in a sense, become a body of sin, a body used to fulfilling its needs independent of God. Now, that's why that phrase is used, body of sin. Now, why do we all get into this position? Because we want to. That's it. That's it. I know you say to me, Ah, oh, brother, I don't want to. I don't want to lose my temper. I don't want to get angry. I don't want to rule over other people. I don't want to get what I want independent of what it costs anybody else. 
I don't want to enjoy myself, whoever else suffers. But brothers and sisters, I say it in love, you do. That's why we do it. There's something inside each of us that makes us want to do these things. There's a selfish will inside us that makes us want to be God of our own lives and do our thing the way we want to do it and have our own way and insist on our own rights Whoever suffers, really loved ones, there's just something in each one of us that is a selfish will, that is an evil will. And you may say, yeah, well, well, all right, I see that. That's the very thing I can't do anything about. I can't do anything about that evil will. And brothers and sisters, that's what this verse says. That God has done something about it. You're dead right. A selfish will can't destroy a selfish will. You can't make yourself good with all the willing in the world. But God has destroyed that selfish will miraculously in Jesus. That's why he destroyed us all in Jesus. It's the evil will that is the only truly evil thing in the world. Cancer is bad. Uh, promiscuity is bad. All those things are bad. But finally, the only thing really evil is an evil will. And that's what God destroyed in Jesus. A lot of people have made the mistake, you see, oh, we ought to destroy the body. The body by which this independence is expressed. And you remember that led us into asceticism and all kinds of masochistic practices whereby we thought the body is the evil thing. If you can bring down the body, then you'll be free from lust. Then you'll be free from gluttony. Of course, it was a heresy. The body was not the problem at all. A lot of people said, oh, if you can destroy sin, that's the problem. Take sin out of the world and you'll be okay. Loved ones, you can't destroy that power, that personal power of evil in the world. It resides in thousands and thousands of people. You meet it every day you go out. You can't destroy that. Do you see what God did? He destroyed the middle man. He destroyed the middle man. He destroyed the link that connects the power of evil up with your body. That is that miserable, selfish will. And do you see the way the verse reads, if you, if you look at it now, in Romans 6 and 6? We know that our old self, the old selfish will, the old right to itself, the old desire to have its own way, was crucified with him, with Jesus, so that the sinful body, or the body that was used to being the instrument of sin, might be destroyed. And really the word for in Greek is rendered inoperative. So that that sinful body might be left unemployed as far as the sin was concerned. And we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Now brothers and sisters, that's the beginning of the secret of victory in our lives. And I know that God will elaborate it for us in these coming Sundays because Paul goes on to talk about this in greater depth. But do you see the heart of the answer to victory is you cannot will it yourself, but you can be willing for God to destroy that selfish will in you. You can be willing for God to make that destruction real in you. And oh, I don't know, about ten years ago, my life just changed. I'm sure that in many ways, my wife, who knows me well, can see I need to change further. But my life changed, you know from being just an out and out hypocrite, pretending, pretending all the time, but never sensing the thing inside myself, until I came to see that I could not overcome my own selfish will, but God had already destroyed it in Jesus, and he by the Holy Spirit would make that real in me if I was willing. And the heart of it is, are you willing to give him the right to do that? That's really. Are you willing to give the Creator who made you the right to destroy your right to your own way? That's right. And that's a pretty deep thing. And it took me several weeks and months to think that over before I could decide, you know, who was going to be God. And I think with most of us, that's really what we need to do. Because that's a big surrender. I would tell you this, that if you are willing, God actually does it. It's a miracle but God actually does destroy that selfish will. 
if you're willing for him to do it. So it is a real miracle. Dear Father, we thank you that you have done the impossible. You have done something about this will that wriggles and rebels inside us. Father, we've been struggling for years to overcome it by willpower and by substituting better habits. But Father, we see now that we've been trying to change something that we are incapable of changing. And we thank you, Lord, that you have brought an answer that is real. And we thank you, Father, that you did not destroy Jesus instead of us. You destroyed us with Jesus. And you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the God of eternity, who sees the past and the future all in one great moment, you are able to lift us into that eternal place where there is no past and there is no future. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're able to make that death and destruction real in us here in the 20th century. Father, we thank you for that. I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters, to whom this is as baffling as it was to me at the beginning. And I pray that you, by the Holy Spirit, will, as the Sundays pass, make this more and more clear to each one of us. And Father, above all, that we'll see that when we give you the right to take away our right to our own way in all kinds of little unimportant things and in all big things, then you are able to fill us completely with your Holy Spirit and make the crucifixion of Christ real in us. We thank you, Father, that the work has already been done. Thank you that we don't need to strangle the selfish will. Thank you that it has already been crucified in Jesus. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.